um, Tim Carlberg from the Skull Foundation. It's my uh, pleasure to bring Lauren and Rodney into this discussion, filling in for, for my colleague, Liz, who's having some technical difficulties. Um, Rodney and Lauren, we obviously just had the, the great opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about your work and understand um, some of the challenges that you're trying to, to address. One of the questions that I wanna open up with is just how do you, when you start to think about the immensity of the problems you're trying to solve, how do you, where do you start in your process when you think about how you develop the different programs for, for Common Future? Well, I appreciate the question, Tim, and thank you for being able to step in. So last second, literally last second, um, technical difficulties always happen can't plan for everything, right? Um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge just how excited Lauren and I are to be a part of the Skoll Awardee community. I think when we were last at the in-person um, a, a forum back in 2019, you know, Lauren and I were just first timers to the forum and just really getting a sense of the amazing Skoll community. And so it's just remarkable for us to be able to be a part of the community officially now. And so just want to acknowledge that. Um, to your question specifically, Tim, I think one, the fact that it, fact is that many of us still have to understand just how significant the challenges are in terms of where our economy has taken us, both in the U.S. Common Futures really focus explicitly in the U.S., a bit of Canada, but mostly in the U.S. And obviously globally, we're really recognizing just how unfair and intentional our economy has been in terms of marginalizing individuals and communities, particularly those that are of color and come from um, communities that have been just exploited and extracted from. So one is like really wrestling with that, Tim, because so many still don't recognize. We talk about it being such a historic issue, but it's actually contemporary. How many times do people read something in the news that's really seems like you're reading something from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago in terms of the levels of injustice, the racial and economic injustice? So one of the things that we think about at the principal core of how we think about our initiatives and our programming, Tim, is really getting as proximate as possible to individuals and communities that are most impacted adversely by these injustices. And so that's the first part. I think oftentimes we talk about solutions as these like really specific models that can be just, you know, uh, tinkered with and, and, and replicated any, in any community. But actually, community is so central. And so we actually listen to and see power to communities that have actually been impacted adversely by these challenges. So that's the first step for us. And the second step is actually for us to be able to acknowledge the things that we do not know, Tim, right? And, and, and be able to be in deep listening in conversation with folks that have been deeply impacted. That's great. And I guess, Lauren, when I, bringing you into the conversation, I'm curious, what do you find as the sort of, critical nature of, of, of the team's work. Like we've talked previously at School World Forums about the power of proximity, the understanding of, of being close, of those being closest to the challenge, leading the change, believing in the, you know, the strength of community over the strength of individuals to do it alone. How would you describe like, what is the, the sort of like core, some people refer to it as the, the secret sauce, but what do you think is the, the, the key to success for Common Futures work? I love that question, Tim. Um... And, you know, I know we're in great company here, um, given your all's perspective of, of understanding how important proximity to the issue at hand is to solving some of these really sticky problems. You know, the secret sauce is, is a difficult uh, question because, you know, so just for some context, Common Future, oftentimes folks ask us, you know, what makes your community so different? What makes Common Future, you know, so well positioned to solve, to, you know, start to solve some of these really sticky economic systems issues? And at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is trust. Um, you know, that's something so many folks speak about um, so beautifully, but really we are creating systems for us to consistently see trust as an institution and for our network to organically grow itself. So, you know, oftentimes we describe our work as a think and do tank. And so I kind of want to take that up this opportunity to explain what that means a little bit to us. So oftentimes when folks hear think tank, they might think of, you know, a research institution. And you also might think of talent that comes from a certain pedigree. So, you know, in the U.S., oftentimes uh, some of the most powerful think tanks will hire folks that, you know, had an Ivy League, Ivy League education or maybe they came from a really powerful institution that um, is, you know, charged with solving global 
problems like Deloitte or, or McKinsey or something like this. And of course, there's amazing work that's being done by those institutions. But kind of what we're asking at Common Future is, you know, the scale of the issues that we're up against is so enormous. How else might we tackle some of these issues? You know, half of the global population only holds 2% of the world's wealth. Well, 10% um, of the, the top 10% of the global population holds 76%. That means we should probably have more folks working on these issues than just those same institutions, right? And so what we've really positioned ourselves to do is to identify visionary leaders that are both using data and research, but also their lived experiences and their understanding of how these problems manifest on the ground to inform those issues. So we really try to marry both of those perspectives together. And I think we do it in a really exciting and unique way. And, and one other piece I'll mention is that I think one part of Common Future that makes us you know, unique and that um, allows us to solve these problems creatively is that we try to be as open as possible. So we don't think of Common Future as an individual institution working in a silo trying to sol solve these issues. You know, we actually recently launched a pretty exciting program. Um, it's called Common Futures Policy Incubator. And for that program specifically, we brought in talent from so many different um, uh, sectors across the social sector. So um, global consultancies, um, law firms, community organizations, existing think tanks that have really amazing ideas and some of the issues that we're up against. And we're trying to position the leaders that work on the ground um, to be supported by these diverse social sector leaders, because we know that we can't solve these problems alone. We have to do so together. Great. Well, I see Liz is back from her technical difficulties. So Liz, I'll pass over to you. But Rodney, Lauren, couldn't be more excited to welcome you guys to the school community. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. And this is the beauty of going live. I think I, I brought this upon myself because I noted like, what kind of flaws can we bring into the live chat? Um, and here we are. But thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Liz Diebold, Managing Director at School Foundation. I've had the privilege of working with uh, the Common Future team for the past um, year or so and couldn't be more excited to welcome them to the community. Um, uh, Rodney, I want to turn to you. You know, Lauren, you just kind of talked through some of the the problems in the in the way you're going about um, addressing those, but um, what are we really excited about, um, Rodney? What's what, what's what's giving you energy these days as you think about tackling um, these these really tough challenges? Yeah, thanks for the wonderful question, Liz. Um, obviously, so much of what Lauren has already spoken to about like the policy incubator and the work that we do with communities and individual leaders that are exceptional and are driving phenomenal change in their communities. That's always an inspiration to me on a day to day level, um, Liz and. That's something that's inspiring because there's so many challenges to your point, to Lauren's point, that oftentimes we have to be able to recognize the, the inherent talents, capabilities, and brilliance that are inside of the communities that are most impacted by injustices. And so when I think about what I'm really excited about as, as it pertains to the work of Common Future, obviously Lauren spoke about the policy incubator and, and, and more of that think and do tank approach that we take as an organization. And also I'm thinking a lot about the ways that we're modeling for others what investment might be inside of communities that are not about really return of investment to those individuals and institutions that already have capital supremacy, but actually really about creating reparative and regenerative economic systems that are actually benefiting communities that have been most adversely impacted. And so for example, Tim asked about the types of initiatives and programs that we, that we do and how we think about them. You know, we have this capital strategies team, this unit in which Common Future is actually working with organizations that are representative of communities across the country, across the U.S., uh, particularly Black and Brown communities, POC communities, and actually working with these institutions to develop different types of alternative investment and capital models. Again, models that do not actually prioritize the interests of those with a significant wealth already, but actually are about redistributing wealth. And so we've, we've, we've talked a lot about our capital strategies work in terms of things of innovating around our character based lending pilot in which we've invested capital out of common futures own balance sheet and then invited other investors to be able to share power in, in decision making rights. Our team is currently looking at all the alternatives right now in different communities, particularly black communities in the US in which we can actually develop additional capital structures that can be supportive and regenerative and reparative of communities. 
We're also looking at a number of different models as it pertains to employee ownership, which is another area for building worker power in the US and across the globe. So as Lauren was talking about, we're working with the phenomenal organization Concerned Capital and another partner, Urban Manufacturing Alliance, to really look at ways that we can actually generate employee ownership at a different scale. So that's another thing that I'm really excited about, Liz. And then also just today, actually, our team is having a conversation around opportunities to reimagine the care economy and how we can create cooperative opportunities for ownership, particularly in uh, childcare, where disproportionately women of color represent the workforce. And as we know, or many of us actually do not know, um, those wages are not family sustaining wages. They don't allow for you to create any kind of meaningful wealth. And so what might it look like in, for those workers to actually have the economic power necessary for them to build fulfilling lives? And we're also looking at, Liz, opportunities for communities to acquire real estate and land in ways that actually will benefit their communities and are not put into the hands of extractive investors that are many, many, many miles away from these communities. So I'm really excited about that because these are extraordinary leaders and in institutions that people do not oftentimes see when they're at a certain perch, but people in those inside of those communities understand their power. Rodney, that's a lot. You, you, just, you just outlined a whole lot of work that I know takes many, many folks to make happen. Um, and that's one of the things that I most appreciate about your work is that the, the partnership, the engagement, um, the recognizing your relative role and necessary contribution, but also recognizing where others need to lead. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk through that a little bit. Um, where does Common Future sort of fit within the ecosystem? And as you think about the next, say, couple years, what are the biggest opportunities for Common Future to play a role to help elevate all of the wonderful work and, and partnerships that, that you've got going on around the country. Thanks, Liz. So I'm gonna actually tag team a bit with Lauren on this one. So Lauren, why don't you tackle Liz's first question around where we're situated in the ecosystem and I'll talk a bit about our next year or two. Sure, that sounds great. And thanks for the question, Liz. You know, I think we sit, and this is kind of getting back at what we were speaking to about before around our orientation as a think and do tank. Um, I think first we want to model the change we want to see in the world. So we're really, you know, there's a lot of work ahead of us, as Rodney just named, but we really want to dive in there with the communities that we work with and figure out what exactly is going on and how can we amplify and make this impact even greater. So, so doing the thing first, I think, is, is our primary um, goal. And then I think we have a, a really interesting orientation around trying to bring folks along. So we try to influence strategic players within the ecosystem who we think might be interested in learning from these models. So, you know, we have a couple of really exciting programs that work with um, foundation leaders who are interested in replicating some of these strategies um, so folks can learn how to do things like create um, democratic decision making um, uh, funds so that communities are determining where certain um, funding allocations go to ultimately. Um, we also work with a number of investors on doing this kind of work. And, you know, through the policy incubator program, we're working on bringing some think tanks along in our journey as well. Um, but I think more so than, you know, simply our think and do orientation, I think what also makes us unique is the fact that we specifically target working with what we sometimes refer to as field defining interventions. So we really look at those interventions that are really going to change the game around some of um, the stickiest issues around our economy. Um, you know, some folks might be familiar with something called an abundance agenda. So Ezra Klein and Derek Thompson from The Atlantic have been speaking about this lately. But essentially what that agenda points to is saying instead of pushing for a laundry list of marginal improvements, we really need to dream big and think about the types of solutions that really are going to change the systems in which we operate. And I think Common Future embodies that pretty well. You know, of course, we have a long road ahead of us and these problems are quite daunting. Um, but we're part of a movement of organizations that are really pushing this mindset about what's possible and showing folks that we can and we should dream big. Thanks for that, Lauren. I think that um, the dreaming big piece and really to everything that Lauren's already talked, spoken about and Liz, to your, your earlier comments about the types of partners and institutions and leaders that we work with, there's already such tremendous capability and capacity there. At, as a society, we don't recognize those capabilities though. And, and so when I think about the next year or two, it's a, it's, a, it's a 
tough question because as we know, two years ago, we weren't anticipating being in this world that we're living in right now. So I will situate that and going back to your point, Liz, earlier, sometimes flaws happen and you can't plan for everything. But I think the thing that we're really geared upon and what we're really central and, and focused on over the next year or two um, is everything that Lauren pointed out, a number of things are really talking about influence. We're talking about building a certain type of reputation on social capital that can actually drive not just ideas, but also decision-making in particular ways that we have not seen at in, in mass and at, at a large scale. And so I think one of the things that we're, we're really interested in as an institution is actually being able to really to Lauren's point about the policy incubator, pulling in individuals whose voices have been sidelined purposefully, have been intentionally left to the sideline. How do we actually take those viewpoints, those perspectives? How do we make sure that they're mainstreamed and they're not on the sideline? Right? That's a big goal of the next year or two. But I think centrally for us in the terms of influence, that is such a thing that is it's, 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 it's pertinent, it's necessary. Every single day we make decisions as individuals and as institutions that are defined by the ideologies that we're stepping in every day. And so Common Future really wants to be able to drive forward different types of ideologies, concepts, ways of viewing the world that really recognize the inherent capabilities of those that have been just exploited and extracted from. So that's a big goal. <laughs> we really want to be able to supplant and, and, and shift narratives around what it looks like to actually have power and community wealth in the US, for example. We want to make sure that that's something that people are talking about, that it's something that is prioritized, that is not something that is just discussed at a sideline conversation and there's no action, there's minimal action taken. So to Lauren's point about things like the participatory investing work that our team is doing, our colleagues are working on, really making sure that funders and investors are cashing in what they're talking about in terms of seeding power, in terms of seeding control. Let's make sure that that happens. So that's something that we're looking forward to. The last piece on this too, Liz, is we're really looking at to, to everything that Lauren has pointed out in this ecosystem approach. How does Common Future as an institution really enable other partners to leverage our capabilities, right, as, a, as an actual institution um, to build upon their own work and accelerate their work? So that not everything needs to be held by Common Future, to your point, Liz. We're working in deep partnership with so many others, but how can we actually improve the likelihood of success for those institutions and those partners? And so that is something that we're really eager to be working on over the next two years. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, I, just to, Lauren, you talked about pedigree earlier, and I just feel like there's a maybe a call to action we can all take to investigate what we mean by pedigree, whose voices we not only listen to, but value, um, not just in this work, but all of our work day to day. Um, Rodney and Lauren, you're, we're getting questions um, from, from the audience about the barriers. Um, and I know that that we've been talking a lot about the solutions so far, but I wonder if you, if you could take a moment to talk through the specific question was the barriers around um, community acquisition of land. But I think for every single one of these sort of programs, projects, pilots, ideas that that you've outlined so far, um, the starting place is in having to sort of unpack some systemic barriers to to find success. Um, so what would you say are the the sort of the top barriers that you're facing in this work and and how are you going about to to roll them back? Yeah, so it's a great question. I'm to the specific question on the barriers to community acquisition of land, and it does to your point, Liz, implicate other areas of work. Um, one of the systemic challenges that we see is one that is really central again on how we view the world. So one of our amazing partners, um, Jessica Norwood, the founder of Runway, looks at this as, and calls this um, believe in you capital, belief capital. And why this is critically important is that when you look at something like the acquisition of land and real estate by community, let's just be frank, one of the significant barriers is actual lack of tangible financial resources. That's a systemic challenge. And so when we're looking at communities that we work with, institutions that we work with that are looking to acquire real estate that can actually be co-owned by community or leveraged in a way that actually benefits community as a community asset, well, they're competing against financial resources that are 10x anything that they're probably even dreaming of right now, right? They're looking at, they're competing against private equity interests, they're competing against all sorts of forms of capital 
that are not necessarily proximate and inside of those communities. So I just want to be real in terms of like that is a practical barrier. And so one of the challenges that is, again, this is one of the reasons why my team is investigating this and is actually putting forth concepts and ideas and, and resources around this is how can we actually make sure that there is a, a form of capital that institutions that are looking to acquire real estate and land for ownership of community and benefit of community actually have the financial resources, the tangible financial resources to do so in a manner that is actually meeting the timeline required um, to do so. And I think about the you know, character-based lending and some of the other investments that we're looking to make over the next several months in which Common Future is typically going to be the first capital in, or, or maybe going to serve as sort of the, again, that believe in you money that Jessica Norwood talks about so powerfully. Um, and so that is something that we recognize as a significant barrier, right? That is uh, is very tangible and concrete. <laughs> there needs to be more financial resourcing that is actually of the control of communities. We oftentimes let's talk about access to capital. We don't talk enough about control of capital. And that's one of the things that we work on a lot at Common Future. Okay, so now I have to ask, what does a, a shift in control of capital mean? What does that look like? It looks like, it, to give you an example, when I think about uh, uh, character-based lending is one example um, that we've been able to practice. It was common future, typically for those who are not necessarily involved in investment uh, or, or making investments, the investor controls so much. The investor who has, again, that's why I made that term, I use that term capital supremacy. Like those that have the capital get to set the terms of the game effectively. And that is the rates, the terms for an investment or the deal, the years, how capital is actually allocated. And so an example of character-based lending, we see that in all of those things. So Common and Future said, it's working with our partners who understand their communities far better than we ever could and said, we have a form, we have financial capital we recognize that it's important, it's equally as important and potentially less important than the actual community capital, relational capital, the knowledge that you have about your community. And so seeding that, making sure that they were able to actually set the terms of the investment, right? And really seeding all that, that the decision making to them versus common future setting those terms. And then we leverage our own power or relative power to our partners to ensure that those who were coming in as co-investors alongside us understood and actually applied the same sort of thesis in, in terms of how they were making their investments as well. That is what I mean by like shifting control of power and making sure that those that are most impacted actually have voice of control over uh, their own futures. I've come to sometimes refer to your work as power intermediation. So <laughs> thanks for, for bringing that to life a bit. Um, Lauren, did you have anything to add before we move to another question? I think Ronnie covered it pretty well. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so as always in the work that we do, we have a question about expansion and where else can we do this? Um, and I think Rodney and Lauren, I've asked you along the way, what, like, why are you not just becoming an empire? We need, we need this work everywhere. It's not just the what you're doing, but the how you're doing it. Um, so how do we just make you the world's largest, whatever? And you're like, no, 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 that's not our role. Um, so I'm curious what you think about expansion beyond the U.S. or or even sort of helping folks understand how to replicate the model. Well, it's interesting, Liz, because I think there's so much for the U.S. to actually learn from the global community. And so that's actually one of the things that we're excited about, about being a part of the Skull communities and actually how can the global stage help us learn more about what we can do in the U.S. But I think to part of your question too, Liz, is how we think about influence. And Lauren spoke to this really powerfully around policy incubation and advocacy and our influence work with, with funders. Our aim is not that Common Future needs to become an empire. What we think about is how do we actually like take the lessons that we've learned and applied ourselves uh, as a think and do tank and assist others in terms of implementing the same strategies and similar strategies. Obviously having to be considering how their actual communities operate. And so much of that, Liz, is about changing mindsets and worldviews. Um, I've said this before that technical challenges are typically not the most difficult thing for people to figure out. It's actually where someone's heart and mind is relative to how they look at their community. And when I say they, I'm talking about 
investors and funders and policymakers, particularly right now, not those who are on the ground doing the hard work. Um, but how do they actually how do they look at these individuals in these communities? And so when we think about scaling for a common future and expansion, it's really how do we shift and scale the worldviews that people hold inside of themselves and, and also how those institutions can shift accordingly. That said, Liz, I did make a comment earlier about different ways that common futures thinking about, hey, we have an infrastructure. How can others leverage that infrastructure? Not in a fiscal sponsorship type way, if people are familiar with fiscal sponsorship, that's not what I mean. I'm actually talking about deeper partnership and really leveraging the collaborative capabilities, the platform that is common future so that we could institutionally become um, not an empire, Liz, but a platform that has some decentralized and autonomous opportunities to make decisions and create change in communities. And so we do think about that as well and, and looking less about how to become an empire because a big part of the reason why we're in the situation that we're in is because empires, <laughs> right? Um, that is actually a big piece of why we're here. And so that is something that we think about a lot, Liz, is how do we actually change and transform some of the, the institutional mechanism in which people think about scale and expansion. In other words, I think and do tank. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left and we do have some additional questions, but I fear that we wouldn't give them um, justice. Lauren, um, Rodney, is there anything else that you just wanna, this is your moment, this is your stage. Um, you've got a captive audience. Is there anything else you just wanna share or bring into the room or um, put, put on our brains? Thanks so much, Liz, for the opportunity. I mean, as Rodney spoke to when we first uh, began the conversation, we could not be more excited to be part of this community. And as Rodney just spoke to um, and connected to folks that are doing this work um, at the global scale and, and, and across the world. And so just um, we are eager to partner with anyone who is looking to solve these problems. Um, if you're interested in ceding power to the communities that you work with, if you're interested in learning more about what it means to engage with these models and replicate them in your own communities, please reach out to us, info at commonfuture.co. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing from you all and, and working with you. Rodney, anything from you? Now, just to double down on what Lauren just said, um, we're actively looking for partnerships. Um, we're, as I pointed out earlier, Liz, um, this is, everyone knows this, but one of the, the biggest barriers to getting change done is having the type of capital to be flexible. We're fortunate at a common future that we've been able to develop flexible capital structures. And so we're looking to expand on that as well. And so um, looking for deep partnership, looking to be able to grow our work in a way, as I pointed out, Liz, that is not empire-like, <laughs> but is actually something that could scale in a different type of way that really acknowledges the capabilities of individuals that are part of these phenomenal communities and have done so much strong work. Thank you so much. I continue to be deeply, deeply inspired um, and grateful, inspired by and grateful for your work. And um, it looks like there's there's folks in our audience who are as well. So really warm, warmest welcome to the school community. Thank you so much for sharing your time um, and space with us and, and all of your ideas and terrific work. Thanks, Liz. Great. <laughs> it's good to be back. Thanks, Liz, Rodney, Lauren, for a great discussion. Um, switching gears from building inclusive economic systems in the U.S. to strengthening um, democracy in Brazil, it's uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Alessandra Orofino from the from Gnosis, the uh, co-founder and executive director. Um, Alessandra, like over the past two three years. It has been just such a privilege to watch and learn from your work and, and, and from your team to have visited your programs back in 2019 before we all went into lockdown and to see firsthand just the, the incredible work and the breadth of the work that you're doing. Um, in the opening plenary, we learned that um, Gnosis is a laboratory um, for civic engagement, collective activism, creating opportunities for Brazilian citizens to organize, to support each other, to advocate for their collective needs. One of the things that I've just been, frankly, had time, had a hard time sometimes getting my head around, but also just overly impressed with, was just the breadth of these of these programs. Everything from advocating for basic income um, programs um, for the most vulnerable uh, in Brazil during the outbreak of COVID nineteen, 
legal and, and psychological support for women trapped in abusive relationships, anonymous reporting of, of police violence and, and brutality. And, and my question to you is just, you know, with as these programs have evolved from over the last decade, um, what's been the kind of through line? What is the core of, of what Gnosis is about and what, the, what your programs seek to achieve? Thank you, Tim, for the great question. And hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, thinking about the past 10 years and what the core of what we do really is, I keep going back to this matter of collective action. NASA solves problems through collective action. And that's not the only way to solve a problem, right? Traditionally, advocacy efforts are more sort of 101. Um, usually they rely on having some sort of access to power. So more traditional advocacy organizations tend to have and build relationships over time that are really valuable because they allow them to then access power, access people in power, and bring agendas that are hopefully of common interest. Um, and I think at least in Brazil, um, traditional advocacy organizations have done a really good job in many issues. Um, but as the democratic institutions have become less open to that kind of dialogue with civil society, it has been harder and harder to affect change through that. And in our case, what we do is essentially organize the community itself. And the reason why we believe that's an important piece of the puzzle, well, it's, it's twofold. First of all, when the community organizes itself, people who may not have that kind of access, may not be able to build that kind of relationship, also get to play a part in this sort of game of democracy, right? They gain access to decision makers, or they find solutions to common problems through community efforts. Um, and that allows them to more fully participate in democratic processes, not just as voters, but as full-fledged sort of actors in democracy. So that's the first reason we really believe that community empowerment and collective action are a key piece of the puzzle. The second reason is that when you accomplish something through collective action, these sort of policy changes, services that you implement, whatever you do through that mechanism, it tends to be more resilient uh, to sort of changes in government or changes in power in general. Because when you accomplish something through that, that mechanism, you build political capital around it in, an, in, an, in a way that is sort of harder to destroy. And we've seen that in many instances of our work. I'll just give you one example, uh, Tim, that I think you're familiar with. But we did a big campaign in Sao Paulo many years ago around sort of opening up public spaces in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a huge city. It has a chronic lack of public spaces and green spaces for the population. So we did this big campaign and it was around on Sundays essentially blocking access to cars in certain segments of the city so that people could use the streets and public space. And that was a policy um, that, that got implemented through collective action because people demanded it. When there was a change in government and a new mayor came in, he promised to essentially destroy everything that the previous mayor had done. And that was one of the very few policies that he didn't touch because the, the sort of the political capital associated with it. And even the new mayor even said that out loud. He said, I'm not gonna touch that because that was not something that my predecessor did. That was something that the people of Sao Paulo wanted. And that I think changes everything. Yeah, so following up on that. So, I mean, the, even just in this conversation, you bring up these different campaigns and these, but these problems you're trying to solve for, how do you prioritize? Like, what is the process that you and your team go through against so many problems that, that, that our societies are facing today, how do you identify which ones are the most important and where your collective action and access to power for communities will be most effective? Yeah, of course. It's really hard to prioritize, right? Because yes, sometimes it feels like the world is sort of this never-ending list of issues and new problems every day. And to a certain extent, that's right. Um, what our team does is that it listens to our partners and it listens to our community. And that's the first thing, right? We really listen to what our partners have to say. We're not issue experts. We are a multi-cause organization. We work across the board on different issues that are important to citizens and citizens live their lives in a multi-cause way, right? Like you go through different iterations of your life, you, you wear different hats, um, and then you face sort of public issues um, and you experience your city, your community, your country in different ways throughout even a, a given day. So that's why we're a multi-cause organization. But our partners may be very issue specific. Oftentimes they are experts in their fields and they know what, re what really matters to the cause that they have chosen and they have dedicated their lives to. So we really listen to them. 
And we really want to be sort of a tool in their toolbox. We want to make sure that they can access Melsa's when they need to do a campaign on an issue because we have an audience, we know how to build that audience, how to build new constituencies around different causes, but we're not going to know exactly what's important at every single vertical. So that's the first thing that we do. And the second thing that we do to prioritize is that we assess the urgency of an issue. And assessing the urgency of an issue, of course, is really hard sometimes because things that may seem very urgent to us may not be very urgent to others. It's, it's, it's hard to do, but we have a certain set of criteria to assess an urgency of an issue, which includes something that we call emotional urgency, which may not necessarily be how urgent something is on a sort of schedule, um, but it really speaks to how people are feeling about an issue. And that, I think, changes every day with the news cycle, but also with sort of new things that emerge that may not be a part of people's lives right now, but they slowly sort of creep their way into sort of this sort of realm of preoccupations that communities have around the country. And as you, you know, 10 years in, a lot of organizations are trying to solve a problem, say they're finished and completed, but I think rebalancing power, whether it's in Brazil or democracies around the world, is a, is, is a lifelong or multi-generational effort. So, but as you look at the next decade of Gnosis's work, what kinds of things do you see on the on the horizon for you? What's what's exciting? How do you see your work evolving to meet the the new the newest set of challenges that that you're facing and our communities are facing? Well, of course, when I look at the next ten years of Gnosis's work, I can't help but wonder about the next ten years of Brazil, right? And right now, that's not a given. We just don't know what's going to happen in Brazil. Our democracy is sort of hang, hanging by a thread there. Um, and we're hoping that we're going to have that we're going to be able to sort of claim it back this year, but we're not entirely sure. So it's hard to tell. But what I know for sure is that what really excites me about the work that we do today is that we've been able, over the course of the last decade, to really build new constituencies, and that is not an easy thing to accomplish. So when I look at a project like Mapa do Acolhimento, our project sort of handling uh, trauma and gender-based violence in Brazil, where we offer um, a woman that has survived gender-based violence, access to mental health and legal services pro bono, that is a project that has built a huge constituency of women, either the volunteers or the, or the women that reach out for help, um, that really now trust each other. They have built an identity, a common identity, and they have built trust. And now that they've done that, they know that they have collective power and they're ready to deploy it. So which, what really excites, excites me about MAPA, for instance, is to really watch that constituency then really flex their muscles, really do something with the collective power that they've built, with the trust that they've built, with the identity that they've built. And I hope that we'll be able to do that across other kinds of identities, because I really think that sort of more traditional constituencies that have traditionally organized people power are in many ways sort of weakened right now. We haven't really figured out as organizers how do you build collective power when those traditional sort of mechanisms of power building are weakened? Political parties are a little bit weaker. Uh, unions are unfortunately a little bit weaker. The nature of labor has changed so much in Brazil and across the world. People just have different sort of relationships to labor that it's harder to organize. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't organize. It means that we're going to have to find sort of these new mechanisms for building collective identity in this sort of more uh, precarious in many ways world. Um, so we can deploy that power. And I'm really excited to see that come to fruition because it's taken us 10 years to get to a point where we have strong communities that really trust us and each other. And now we're going to be able to see them do things in the world, which is going to be really exciting. That's great. That's great. You know, I wonder, once upon a time, I got to be a fly on the wall down in, down in, in, um, in Rio watching your campaign team organize tens of thousands of people across these different communities and networks that you've built. To, to stand up to a last minute piece of legislation that was going through um, the federal government in Brazil. And I just, as someone who was just absorbing that energy of what that true co you know, collective action can be like, it was exhilarating. And so I guess I, my question before we start opening it up to the, to the broader audience for, for some questions is, what do you find? I mean, it's, it's, this work can be hard. And I know that there's been a lot of hard times for you and your team over the years, both personally and professionally. But there have to be times where 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 there's a lot to celebrate, and so I'm curious, like what are what are what is the most rewarding part of this of this work for you and for your team? This is definitely one of the parts where we get to celebrate. So um, it's really a big reward, just the recognition to be able to join this community to bring 
a team with me and it's just amazing. But I think on, on a more daily basis, because unfortunately we don't get prizes like this every day, but on a more daily basis, I think just hearing back from the people that we mobilize from our community is really rewarding. And we do that and all, every day because we get messages and emails and phone calls from our community every day. It's hard to manage. We now have a dedicated team and all they do is sort of listen in to the community. For a long time, we didn't have that and it was a really sort of a deluge of communications. But once you sort of manage that and you're able to read into that and you see the patterns, that is exciting because we see people winning really important political battles in their community, being able to implement policy that they believe in, change public services in their community. In the case of Mapa do Acolimento, we see women that have left cycles of violence that are now healthier and stronger and able to help other women. And they write to us every day. Every day we get testimony like this. In the case of the Fezapi, what we, do, what we did um, collaborative reporting of police violence, we had some of the families of victims who were for the first time finding justice. The Fezapi was able to sort of push through one of the very first or the very first case of a criminal conviction to a high ranking police officer in Rio, in the state of Rio, since the end of the military dictatorship. The first time a high ranking police officer was convicted for police violence. It was through a, a case that was sort of pushed uh, forward. And that is incredibly rewarding because you see the family sort of starting to believe in justice again. And being able to watch that and sort of see that shift when people start believing in democracy again and they get how it works and they realize the power that they have and they are getting excited about deploying that power, that is incredible. I love that. I, I, I recall meeting one of your partners, you know, a local community member who it was after she had sort of affected the change she was seeking but you could see that 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 switch and i could imagine what she was like before before she believed in her own you know self efficacy in her own ability to be able to create change and how she almost stood 3 inches taller um once she had realized the power that she can uh, mobilize within her community and the change that that she can create i'm curious like as a leader in this space i've always been just deeply impressed with you and that of your whole team and all the folks that i've been able to meet there but i'm curious like what have you learned about yourself along the way i, I think about that woman who who you know stands just a few inches taller when she realizes the power she has but i think of like what gnosis has been able to achieve and as a community and as a network of partners. What have you learned about yourself, Alessandra? That's a hard one. Um, I've learned a few things, but I think maybe the most important one is that I am at my best and I think I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more um, effective when I'm sort of leading from behind, right? I am an outspoken person. I love meeting people. Um, it's, I'm, I'm not particularly uncomfortable being in the spotlight. But I've learned that that is not the place where I do my best work. I do my best work by being relatively quiet and letting other people shine as we sort of go through this process of sort of realizing our collective power. So I've a few years back, I sort of, you know, I withdrew from social media. I started to sort of really value the moments in which I could work with my team different teams across Brazil doing different things that I really believe in, but not necessarily having me be the face of it all the time. And I think that for me, it's been such a change in the way that, that the results sort of show, right? I can, I can see how it's changed the work that I do, how it's changed my relationship to my team, how it's changed my relationship to my partners. And it's been a really peaceful moment for me to sort of realize that I can be quiet and still do amazing work and really see the results in real life. Yeah, and, and for what it's worth, I've seen just the, the, the incredible growth. I mean, just such a strong team you've built underneath and, and working with you and partners just even beyond. And that brings us to a, a couple of questions that are starting to pop up in the comments. So anyone listening, I'd love for you to just start dropping more questions in. But one of the questions is, you know, a lot of your projects are collaborative. Gnosis is an orchestrator of, of, of other organizations, bringing them together for collective action, both individuals, but also organizations. And one of the questions is, do you collaborate on international projects? And are you actively approached by other organizations? And how do other organizations get access to the tools and techniques and networks that you've created? Yeah. 
So we, we are asked that a lot, and the, the short answer, yes. Yes, we do. We do collaborate on international projects, but we do not lead on them, uh, at least not for right now. Right? We really believe that in order to affect change at a community level, you really need to know the community. We started our work as a city-based organization and then we grew to become a national organization. But we really still believe in that sort of city focus and that community focus and that neighborhood focus. So when we do collaborate internationally, it's more through sort of sharing what we've learned, sharing our platform. We use our own bespoke uh, technology for all of the campaigns that we do and the solidarity networks that we build. And that is something that we are able to share with partners across Brazil, but we've also shared them internationally, in particular with Latin American organizations in the past. And we have done international trainings also in Latin America in the past on our methodology and the things that we have discovered. Um, so if there are partners internationally that want to work with us, we're happy to work with them, but we're not going to take the lead on international work because we just don't know. We don't know the context and the political context and the partners and the experts in the same way that we do in Brazil. So that's really where our focus is for now. That's great. And there's, there's obviously a lot plenty to be done in Brazil. Oh, yeah. So um, as we sort of wait for other questions to come in, you know, one of the things that that was was clear to me as I've gotten to know your work is that as you're trying to adjust power dynamics, those that lose power can sometimes be resentful and or or, or can be and can raise serious concerns for for the safety and well-being of your yourself and your team. And I'm just curious, like as an organization that is doing that kind of work and putting yourselves in in potentially in harm's way, how do you think about the protecting the well-being, but also the safety of, of, of yourself, your family, and your team? This is um, always a hard question to answer because this work shouldn't be dangerous, right? Building collective power, working through collective action, it could be, it's definitely varying, maybe would, you know, make some people uncomfortable, but not to the point of it being dangerous. I and mean, it has been, and I, and I think it has become more and more dangerous as the years have passed. I definitely felt more comfortable doing this work uh, at, at a sort of personal safety level when I started it in 2011 than I do today, almost 11 years later. Um, and that says a lot about the state of Brazilian democracy, our institutions, our society, etc. With that said, um, I think there are a few things that you can do to sort of keep yourself and your team safe. The first thing is, as I was alluding to before, not wanting to sort of be the face of everything not put, not putting your team in that position either and to some extent not putting anyone in that position either it's a lot harder to kill a movement when leaders are too important when they're too sort of central to the community that you're organizing then it's really easy to sort of take them out to be honest either by sheer violence or by scaring them out or by other sort of methods of silencing people and that is still done. It's done in Brazil to many people, in particular people that are most vulnerable. Um, but I think the best way to sort of fight that is by planting so many seeds that everyone kind of knows that, you know, if you take down one tree, the forest will still grow. So it's kind of pointless to, uh, to aim at a particular person uh, or a small group of people. And that's what we've been trying to do, sort of organize so widely that this movement becomes unstoppable no matter what kind of political pressure or even violence may be deployed in process. And with, with all of that, that you're juggling, that your team is juggling, how do you think about like mental health and well-being on your team? Because you're obviously advocating for it, creating systems for it, for people who are struggling in the community with various different challenges. But how do you, how yeah. does a, a, an organization that's dealing with such heavy, I intense projects maintain its own, you know, mental well-being and health? Yeah. Well, I think there are other sort of basic things, right? Taking care of your team, making sure that everyone has sort of, you know, good sort of workplace conditions, that they are under good contracts, that you're paying them uh, well for the work that they do, that you're taking their families into account, that you have health insurance. All of those basic things need to be in place. And I know this sounds obvious, but I don't think they are always necessarily in place in our sector. And we really need to advocate for that first and foremost. Um, in the case of Brazil, you have different types of contracts that you can establish with your team. And 
one of them is sort of more formal and it gives a lot more civility to the people that have them. And that's the one that we privilege because we know that it brings people sort of the peace of mind that they need to have in order to do their work most effectively. Then second, you sort of need to encourage everyone to really take care of themselves and their mental health and support them to the extent that you can. In the case of NASA, we have a mental health policy, we reimburse uh, certain mental health expenses that our team may incur. And for teams that are dealing with trauma more directly, we have supervision because we need that. We need mental health supervisors. In the case of Mapa do Palimento specifically, that is the case. Um, it doesn't change the fact that we deal with heavy stuff. Like right now, we're organizing a new constituency of sort of activists, citizens that are essentially the families um, and uh, that have lost people to COVID. We really think that that is a crucial constituency going forward in Brazil that we have 660 something people that have died of COVID in the past two years. And they of course have left people behind and these families are seeking justice and policies and other things that may make, may make their lives a little bit easier or more bearable at this time. We are helping organize them. We know that they're dealing with grief. And knowing that sort of changes how we organize the project. It changes the pace of things. It changes our expectations around what people will be able to deliver. It just changes everything. It just sort of being cognizant of how grief and trauma change the way that you are in the world and even your ability to fight. It doesn't necessarily make you less able to fight. Quite the contrary, I found that people that have experienced a lot of pain are usually the ones that have the more, you know, a lot of strength to give. But it will change the pace of things. It will change the leadership. It will change the dynamics internally. And you just need to acknowledge that from the from the start and then deal with that as you go. I'm just scanning some questions in the chat. Another headache that um, executive directors like yourself have to deal with is managing donors. So there's a question there about how do you, again, with an organization that has such a, a diverse set of programs, there could be a diverse set of interests being expressed by donors. How do you, how do you manage that, those relationships while allowing your organization to remain focused on its core work, on its purpose, having the ability to like see the landscape and address problems as they come up while also having donors and partners who may have vested interests in certain outcomes? Yeah, I think it comes from, first of all, which donors you have in your roster, right? Like that's the first choice that you make maybe as a as an ED, as you're looking for support for your work. And that's easier said than done, again, because when you don't have any money, you're sort of, it's easy to sort of accept money wherever you can find it. But what I found is that really being diligent to yourself about the donors that you want to work with changes everything down the line. So Nasus doesn't work with certain types of, of donors, right? We don't work with governments, we don't work with political parties, we don't work with private companies that may be operating public services. We really avoid conflicts of interest um, in any way that we can because that gives us then, of course, a lot more independence to do the work that we do. And then, of course, we try to diversify so we're not solely dependent on one donor, uh, again, to safeguard our independence. But on a more sort of personal level, I think, it has to do with building real, true relationships with donors and the people who work in organizations that are grant, you know, grant making organizations. Because those relationships are often really rewarding. You learn a lot through them. And if they are genuine, if there is genuine pleasure in each other, sort of meeting each other and hearing each other's comments on the work, they can become a really central part of even your strategy planning uh, and the way that you work with your team. If they are just sort of done purely for a protocol of these relationships are kind of superficial at best and they are put in a, in a place where it's just about sort of filling reports and, and, and you know and, and making sure that you've, that you've done your homework but you don't see that as an integral part of what you do as a leader then it's really hard because they take a toll on your work right it's a lot of time that you need to dedicate to donor relationships if they're not good if they're not truly informing you as a leader it's a waste of time so I think really putting the energy, the necessary energy to bring the donor along to make sure they truly understand what to do, that they meet your team, that they know what your priorities are. Um, that sort of initial investment in a relationship is crucial to then being able to take the, you know, make the most out of it as the years hopefully uh, go by. Yeah. Lots to, to, to internalize there from that answer, I think, for me personally. I, I, another question talking about managing, you know, just the diversity of partners, the, this constellation of organizations that you work with, there can sometimes be different dynamics of, of, of competitiveness or disagreements on, on, on 
not purpose or but, but, but maybe on practice or on, on execution how do you maintain collaborative working relationships with a very broad network of partners um, across different types of, of organizations different cultures within organizations yeah I think it's always a work in progress, right? You never get it right to, or exactly right, but you try. And I think that as the years pass, partners and organizations in your field will see, will acknowledge that you're acting in good faith, that you that you act in solidarity when need be. And, and I think that notion of solidarity amongst organizations is really crucial to building that kind of trust. I think we talk a lot about solidarity, but to me at least, what it really means is sort of letting other people lead when they need to, when they really have to, when they need to be the ones in the lead. And that is really hard to do because we have a lot of opinions on how things should be done. But oftentimes, I NASA sort of engages in campaigns and projects and programs that if we were the sole decision makers on them, we would do them differently. But we are not, and we know that, and we know that to be a strength. Um, and we sort of let other people lead and we sort of come along as partners and show up in solidarity when we recognize that there's someone else in the room that may know the issue better, um, and we're just gonna have to trust their instinct for once. So that is something that I think really strengthens relationships across the board. Other than that, I think it has to do with building a large enough network of people that are affiliated with you. In our case, we have sort of our staff, of course, but we also have former staff, we have people that we train, we have affiliate organizations that we have helped sort of create and incubate. We have a very broad network of people or collectives or organizations that have different relationships to us, but that feel that sort of affiliation to us to a certain, to a certain degree that can inform the work that we do. They are our eyes and ears on the ground, and they are the ones sort of keeping us accountable to what's really happening on the ground. Because of course, as a team, we cannot be everywhere, um, but through that, we're sort of held accountable and we keep a pulse of what's going on in Brazil. It's such a huge country. It's hard to do that. But I think it's taken us a while. And that's why we sort of grew from being smaller and then scaling up. I think it's common for organizations that are born national to then build chapters that are local chapters. We did the opposite, right? We started as a local chapter and then we grew to become a, a national organization. And that, I think, really informs the way that we build partnerships, the way that we build relationships, the way that we do the work. Oh, wow. The time goes by so fast. There's a load of questions we won't be able to get to. But my final one is just you mentioned, you know, having uh, a, a young child. I also am, am raising an, an under five and it's hard to stay hopeful and positive with so much going on in the world. What what do you personally do to remain positive, to stay hopeful? <sighs> what do I do to remain positive? I definitely spend time with my daughter. I mean, I think if you have a daughter or, or a son under five, it's impossible not to have some level of optimism. Otherwise, what do you do, right? This is going to be, I think this generation is going to face so many challenges, more than my generation did. And, and it pains me to think of the challenges that they will have to face and how, in many ways, ill-equipped they may be because we're not doing our best job yet. So that, that, keep, that I know that may sound negative, but it keeps me positive in the sense that I see that there is so much to do still, and I see the need and the urgency. So when I get tired, when I get exhausted sometimes, when I when I want to give up, when I do something different, I just sort of keep reminding myself that there is a really good reason to be doing this work today. And of course, it's not just my daughter, but for me at a personal level, it is her. It's embodied in her. I look at her and I know, oh no, I have a good reason to be doing this. And if I don't do it, then I won't really be able to live with myself when she's older and she looks at me and she asks me, what were you doing in 2022 as the world was catching fire? You, you and your team were doing a lot. So we're at overtime. Alessandra, to you, to the whole Gnosis team, the whole Gnosis network. We couldn't be more happy and, and, and honored to have you as part of this whole community. Congratulations and looking forward to a long and sustained partnership and continuing to learn from you and your team. Thank you, Tim. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you, everyone who's watching.